and the definition of a mentor is somebody who gets you into bigger problems than you've ever been in before, <laughs> and then help you get out of them, and then figure out what you learn together. So I want to thank you very much, Carrie. I can vouch for that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten a bunch of you into trouble. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if Dave tells me that I have to make a loud noise. We good? Woke right. everybody up. Dave, I'm starting now. Okay, so you know, you've all heard that old saw of uh, you know, when you're a nervous speaker, you think about everybody in the audience as being in their underwear. But, you know, I, I personally think that's undignified for you guys, so uh, I would just like to say you look very nice in your beach attire, quite splendid. Marty, I love your parasol. So, anyway, uh, so my, my hope in giving this talk is really to provide a couple of gems, a couple of pearls of wisdom, or just some good ideas that you will be able to take home with you. Anytime I come to a talk, I'm always looking for those one or two things that are of value. So rather than talk a lot about my company or the technology or things like that, I really wanted this to be something um, where I was sharing some of the things that I've learned over the years. When you've been in an industry for almost 30 years, you get to know a lot of people and you've made a lot of mistakes. So anyway, we'll pass some of that on. The presentation itself is very short. There's only sl eight slides, um, but I'm hoping there'll be a lot of questions and dialogue over the course of, uh, of the whole thing. It's no pictures, no graphs, no charts. I try to reduce this to the minimalist, most important things that really matter when you're starting a company, when you're doing startups. So, um, so Mark Twain had this quote of, you know, I'm sorry I wrote you this long letter. I didn't have time to write you a short one. <laughs> well, this is the short one. I put a lot of, uh, a lot of time into it. So, um, over the course of the talk. It's perfectly okay to ask questions or seek clarifications. If for any reason uh, I think it's too diverting or i too stupid to know the answer or whatever, I may defer them till the end of uh, to the end of the talk, and we can we can kind of revisit them. I want to make sure that we do get through all of the, the slides. Um, the things that I'm about to present are my observations. They're based on my experiences in the entrepreneurial world. Many entrepreneurs, especially venture capitalists, will disagree with some of the, the premises and things, you know, the beliefs that I have about uh, building companies and growing companies and managing uh, people and whatnot. So I'll just put that out there. This is something for you to contemplate, for you to take home and, and figure out really what, what works for you. Um, so, startups are hard, no doubt about that, but they're also incredibly rewarding. This is one of the most fun things. I can't imagine my life not as an entrepreneur. I love starting companies. I love getting you guys in trouble. <laughs> no, not really, no, no. I, I love building things. We, that, we were born to do that together, right? As human beings, we were born to build things together. Okay, so they're hard, but they're not impossible. Technology. Oh, we got it. We got it. Okay. okay, so I thought about this. I had this long list of different types of startups. I reduced it down to two. Okay, when you really seminally reduce everything down to its essence, it's basically two types. For me, anyway. So, one I'm defining as the rockets. Those are companies like Eric Gordon's company, Attentive, where it has this billion dollar potential, super rapid, you know, launch, takeoff kind of thing. Um, I'm not a rocket scientist. I've never ridden on a rocket. Uh, so I'm not going to speak um, to those types of things. With, with a one, one, uh, one exception of saying that those are the companies that are probably uh, the ones that should be venture capital backed. A lot of the things that I'm about to talk about probably shouldn't be venture capital backed. A lot of VCs will disagree, but, but you know, I'm prepared to defend the, the logic as we go through. So I'm not going to really talk about uh, rockets. I'm going to talk about the rest of us, real startups, product companies, service companies, um, you know, those types of those types of things. Okay. Oh, you can edit that out, right, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I said it. Bad. <laughs> 
Okay. So the most, the most no basic to needs to start a company. Again, I tried to reduce this to like this seminal uh, uh, essence, right? So the number one thing that the company really needs is a great storyteller. It's just the truth. When, you st when that company comes together, um, somebody has to be able to tell that story well. It's usually a founder, it's usually a CEO, but not always. Sometimes it's, it's, it's somebody who's brought into the organization to lead it. A CEO. Not yet. You know, there's a lot of founders that have great ideas, but their, their personality or their experience just doesn't lend itself to be a CEO and to raise capital and bring teams together and whatnot. Um, so, you know, to me, it, it's just a fundamental truth, and it's not something that we ever really talk about in kind of business circles. But you have to be able to tell your story really well. In in order to tell it well, you have to do your homework. So the second point is a well-researched, good idea, product or service, and well-researched really makes the difference, right? So as you're mapping out the future of your company, uh, you need to think about how every dollar is going to flow upstream, downstream into that. What are the barriers to entry for this company? Is there a competitive <laughs> hurdle that you're not going to get over that you could have foreseen if you did the homework, right? So the more the research that you put into um, developing or, or kind of formulating your product or service, the more likely you are to be successful in the long run. You will make mistakes. You know, no matter how much effort you put into it, there's going to be stub toes and you know, it's, you're going to make mistakes. But you will make fewer and they will be less severe if you put you know, a lot of work in up front. Um, then you need a good idea. You need, if you're a service company, you need to be able to perform your services very well. If you're a product company, you need to have some compelling product that's going to have competitive advantages. You know, blah 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 blah. That's the stuff that's in the books and you know that that you can read about. And then I almost didn't put it up here because it's it seems kind of obvious to me that you know you need a great starting team to get the company off the ground. If there's no one of us that can do everything well. Right? It just, it's just, uh, just doesn't happen. So, in, for instance, in my case, uh, I'm a pretty good storyteller, but I think most of my employees would agree that I'm, I'm a really poor manager. Right? I'm a better than average leader, and then I'm extremely good strategic vision. So, I can tell the story, but I can't get it all tied together. I can't, you know, I need the team to kind of bring all that those pieces together. So as a founder or a CEO, you don't need to be great at everything. But you, you just need to be great at those things that, um, like storytelling, like engineering, like doing the research and whatnot, to get, it, to get it together and get it off the ground. The best stories are always the ones that you believe in, that are the ones that are the most passionate, that, that, that you, you're so confident that, uh, in, that you're doing the right thing that you can charge forward and, and sell it with confidence. You can raise money because you believe that you're on the right path and this will generate a good return for the investors and you'll be able to create a quality environment for the employees. Um, so in order to have confidence, that gets right back to the homework thing. Right? If you do, your, if you do the, the homework, then you'll have confidence in the things that you bring forward. All right. Oh crap, I've already gone through the third one. I only have eight. We, we might be chatting a lot. <laughs> Um, all right, let's try. <clears throat> all right, there we go. All right, how to fund startups. So there's a couple of basic questions that you need to ask yourself first. Um, and I, the first thing here is a little bit confusing. I couldn't figure out a better way to say it. But um, if you can start with customers first, whether it's a lifestyle business or some other, or a growth business, a business that you're going to grow, that's usually the best way to get companies off the ground. And the reason is because you're going to hold the equity, you'll hold on to the equity, you'll have uh, decisions about how you want to control and, and grow that, that business. So, uh, and, and a lifestyle business, for those of you who don't know, those are businesses that they're not headed for a definitive exit, right? If you take investment capital into your company, you are headed for a definitive exit. One way or another, it's, you know, you're, you're marching on that road together, you're going to have to generate a return for your investment.
investors. So lifestyle companies, you can raise a little bit of, of uh, capital, but um, but it's it's hard. It's usually friends and family money, and uh, more often than not, it's you know getting a customer to place or a few customers to place the first order that gets you seated and get the get the whole thing moving. I'm really not going to talk about lifestyle companies. I'm going to talk about growth companies for the most part. But I'm happy to you know, answer questions. So if you need investment, you got to figure out what's the best for you, and you can do a lot of research and look at books and whatnot, that's probably a great kind of preliminary uh, thing just to sort of fit and see what kind of capital um, will work for you. Um, and it, it really varies. The types of investors, I, I've only listed a few here, there's a lot uh, that, you know, additional ones that could be added. Angel investors are typically the ones that will help to get um, startup companies off the ground, very you know, seed stage, early stage types of things. Angels are not really angels. They're investors, right? They want to make money. If they were angels, they'd just give you the money. <laughs> they want to return on their investment. So, uh, but they, the angel investors generally invest without the um, onerous terms of sophisticated institutional types of investors, right? They're really truly investing because of you and your team and your technology. They're, they're, they're not looking at, you know, they, 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 ex they expect there to be an exit, but they're not, uh, they're not owning that exit, right? So they're investing in you. Um, you can go the grant route to raise capital for your business. Uh, many companies have been very successful raising grants over the years. Um, we've got one at Sage Science. Uh, they, my, I'm not a big fan of grants only in that the tail tends to wag the dog. Yes, you can get money, but you have to honor the intent of that grant. And, they, and, in, and in honoring that intent, you may not necessarily keep your company focused and exactly on the path that it needs to be to deliver the product or, or whatever it is that you're going to bring to market. So grants, yes, you can definitely do it. Just be careful that they don't take you into directions that you really shouldn't be spending your people time and reserves and whatnot on. Um, angel groups, there's a lot in the Boston area um, of angel groups. They, they're sort of mini VCs. They're mostly folks who have been successful in their own businesses, they, you know, cashed out to some level, uh, but they still are active in the game. They uh, like to be mentors. They like to you know, be a little bit closer to the companies and their investments. They tend to usually have venture-esque types of terms. Um, sometimes not quite as severe, but in my experience, I had received two term sheets that were worse than the venture capital terms that I had received. Um, so, the and then from the so from the angel groups, uh, still pretty friendly and whatnot. You get to venture capitalists and private equity, venture debt, IPO. It's all kinds of uh, additional ways um, to raise capital. So you kind of have to figure out what's right for you. Unless you have a rocket, then venture capital is, you know, there are people I'm sure who will disagree with me, but I think you should avoid venture capital unless, you're gonna, uh, you, know, unless you have a rocket blast where you need a crap load of money and it's going to grow really fast. If you need a lot of money and it's going to grow really fast, then that may be the only source where you can really get it. If you don't need a lot of money, you really got to think about that venture capital um, because you're going to be on a slow growth uh, period. Uh, it's very easy, and I've done it, fall into the trap of uh, you know, taking in a lot of cash, burning through a lot of cash, getting down round and diluted, and you know, uh, they're, they're pretty good at what they do. And in the end, if you've got a modestly successful company, you, you may end up with very little or nothing else at the end. Right? So it's just something to be, to be aware of when it comes to venture capital. If you go for venture capital, you also want to know where in the fund you're coming in. Are they, you know, is it a new fund or is it an old fund? Are they heading towards their, uh, the point where uh, the VCs are starting to make money in the fund or not, right? So the way venture capital works, just as a very quick sidestep, is it's sort of this 80-20 rule. The founders of the fund, the managing uh, partners in the fund, go out and raise money from limited partners. They put up a tiny bit of their own, usually it's one or two percent of the total fund. Um, and then they raise the rest of the money from 
funds, you know, insurance companies, all kinds of places like that. And then they start investing that money uh, into companies. When they start to, and then they've got about an eight to 10 year window where they have to cash out out of all these investments and close the fund. It may go a little bit longer, but not much. And they really want to try to wrap things up fairly quickly. So their mission is to get into, the, into what is called their carry as quickly as they can. So the carry is the point where they have paid back all the limited partners, every penny that they've put in. And from there on out, they're going to split everything, 80% to the limiteds and 20% to themselves. So I've seen situations where the VCs are in their carry and uh, they were perfectly willing to sell a, an asset, sell a company, um, you know, dump it uh, at a much lower price because they were going to get 20% of it and the founders got nothing. So these are just the risks. They can also work out extremely well, but it's, you know, as a jaded old entrepreneur who's done a few VC deals, you just have to go in with eyes open. All right. Um, and then I have this wonderful rule that I'm going to share with you. I'm trying not to use profanity, but I think you all, Roger. Here I absolutely agree with everything that you said on the types of investors and pros and cons. Uh, there's a couple other I'd like to hear your thoughts on. Um, one is uh, kind of a cross between the angels and the angel groups. Uh, I know a few folks who use angel list. It's kind of a crowdfunding for for angels. Uh, that can get you a complicated cap sheet, but not so horrible. Uh, and then there's, uh, seems to be catching on back in Europe and here, but the, the uh, broader uh, crowdfunding uh, that can get you a, a really messy cap sheet, but doesn't have to. Um, but you can also get money that you might not be able to get elsewhere. Right, right. I, I would love to be able to speak to it. I just don't have the experience. Has anybody crowdfunded a company here? Yeah. So this, it's an emerging thing. It's you know it seems like it's a pretty exciting um, arena, and I know there's entrepreneurs and law firms and whatnot that are really kind of uh, looking into this and promoting um, crowdfunding types of things. I'm trying to remember some of the some of the sites that do this. Kickstarter. Kickstarter. Yeah. Indiegogo. What is it? Indiegogo. Indiegogo. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a company yeah. in France called Yseed. Yseed? It only invests in French companies, but they've actually had uh, a couple of exits. Oh. That, uh, yeah. It's the kind of thing, they've, they've got an interesting model where they, they, uh, uh, they'll, they'll fund some up to the equivalent of a million dollars or so and fund a, a, uh, some kind of a proof of concept. And then when they're uh, different source of uh, financing comes in with the proper Series A round, they exit all the crowdfunding guys so that you don't have to worry right. about the, the cap sheet being horrible later. Yeah, yeah. So, right, I, it, Roger just, I don't know if you, the rest of you could hear it, but um, in some of these crowdfunding models, when the Series A comes in, a more institutional investor, the, the early uh, folks get bought out, right, at some, uh, some premium on their investment and whatnot. So. Uh, yeah, that's another kind of one of the more guerrilla uh, methods of, of financing your company. I think what it, what it really comes down to when all is said and done is uh, not just who you know, but who knows you. What are the relationships that you've built over the course of time, uh, uh, you know, the trust that you've earned over the course of time, so that you can ask people for help. You can ask friends for help, and they'll 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 either help directly or they'll they'll steer you towards somebody um, in a very you know credible referred way um, for their help in financing the company and many other many other things. Okay, so the rectum rule. <laughs> I maintain that we were all born with the proper number of rectums, and any more than that is just a nuisance, right? So I have learned that. When you, when you hire employees, when you bring in investors into the company, there is this little karmic light that's going on in the back of your mind. When you meet somebody you, and you're about to take a check from them, you know in your heart before you've accepted that check whether this person is going to be trouble down the road for you or not. And I have just learned not to take the check. Just don't, you know, for me anyway, don't do it. There are times when you can manage your way, uh, 
you know, around those relationships and things like that. But there's, there's, almost, there's almost always a better way and a better person and some other better strategic fit waiting for you um, rather than take the, take the check um, from somebody who's really not, not a great fit for you. So, um, oh, what do I do? Sham, you have to be somewhere? No. <laughs> so, yeah, and and when, and this usually happens. You, you know, the uh, the a whatever person usually inculcates themselves in the company at the foundation, right? At the very beginning. If they come in later, you can usually filter it out much easier. If they come in at a founding level, it's much much harder, right? So. Um, it's like a marriage. When you build a company, you're building a, a living thing. You're building a body. All the pieces have to work together, right? Um, you you want to make sure that the first people that come in are, are in there with you, for you. They believe in the vision and mission, and they're going to stick it through the hard times, which are inevitable and whatnot. So, um, so anyway, I can't stress that enough. And, when they, and, and, and there's a lot of people who have a lot of money who are rectums. Right? They, there's a lot of people who, 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 you know, they have the money and they want to, you know, put it to work and whatnot, but um, they maybe have it and wanted to put it to work so much because so many people don't want to take it. So just, just be cautious about those things. Your company is telling you what's right for it. You just have to listen. Okay, next one. Okay. It's all about people. Problems in the company, you know the engineering problems, the chemistry, the research. Uh, one of my uh, friends, Ross Brown, who works with Bernie Gordon, I was lamenting about some engineering problem that we have, and uh, he said, "You don't have an engineering problem." I said, "Well, we talk about this thing's not working right," and he said, "You have a people problem. You have to get your people to do what you need them to do to get past this problem. Everything is a people." Okay, so in terms of the priorities, the constituencies that a founder and CEO needs to serve, I believe, and there's disagreement about this, that the employees should always come first. Right? You're, you should be doing this with them and for them. Everything else is a second. A close second are the customers. Right? Without, without you know, happy employees, it's very hard to have happy customers. Right? So, you want to make sure that the, the you know the, the people that you're serving and even your vendors upstream are happy with you as well. And then the investors and the board, in my opinion, they come last. You have to honor them. You have to communicate with them. You have to keep them informed. You, have, you know you solicit their advice and help. But they're last in line. If you get the first two right, if you have happy employees and happy customers then more than likely, you're gonna have a happy board and happy investors, right? You're more likely to build a successful business if you achieve those first two objectives. Okay, um, if you're building a lifestyle company, I'll take one quick segue here. You may not want to build a board of directors. You may wanna think about building a board of advisors. Board of directors has a fiduciary duty to the company, not to you, to the company. And they vote, they control the, you know, the ultimate uh, governance and guidance of the company. If you're building a lifestyle company that you own 100% of the stock of, you want to, to capture the wisdom of mentors who have been there, business people who have been in the industry before, they know it inside and out, um, they can help you to grow that business, but you, know, you, you may want to just keep it clean and just have an advisory board and, and not have that fiduciary layer in there. At the same time, you should not. You should always bring in boards. I believe that are they are challenging, experienced, capable people. They're not. Oh, your thought. They're they're. You don't want puppets. You don't want to bring your friends in onto the board who are going to uh, vote your way and do what you you want them to do. The real value in a board is based on their experience, right? Their wisdom. When you're screwing up, you want your board to say, you're screwing up, right? The rules around employees, though, aren't they almost the same in the sense that you want them um, <clears throat> to almost complement 
and, and fill in the gaps of your own weaknesses and and, yes. and, and, and recognizing when it's not a good fit. Yes. Knowing that radar. Yep, yep. Uh, Shirley's bringing up a point that I'm going to discuss in, in a slide just in, I think, the next oh, one okay. or two. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, okay, if you're growing a business for an exit, then I would uh, suggest to you that you should build a very balanced board to the, the best of your abilities, right? So, um, you know, board of directors have fiduciary duties, they vote. Um, uh, you want to make sure you bring in people with a nice balanced skill set. Uh, skill set. So, in the case of uh, Sage Science, my company, we have two very successful scientists that are on the board. They built biotech tools and re reagents companies that have been profitable and successful, and uh, they have uh, successful exits. Um, we've got uh, one engineer who. Uh, built his own design engineering firm, a uh, very capable guy. He's actually my partner in the business, Todd Barbera. He's our chief operating officer and CFO. And then uh, we have one Uber engineer, uh, Bernie Gordon, from uh, Analog Devices and, and now Neurologica, uh, who's one of the best engineers any of us have ever met. And he's been a sage and uh, wonderful critic, uh, you know, a, a true mentor in helping us to grow the business. Um, Let's see, and then there's me. <laughs> um, so, and I can tell you that were it not for the support, the wisdom, the sagacity, sagacity of the board, we would have failed. When we got Sage Science off the ground uh, about six years ago, uh, our mission was to, we had a different business model, a completely different investment thesis. Um, we were planning on building products for other companies. So and we would do the manufacturing, we would partner with them on the development of these projects, they would provide funding, we'd provide a little bit of funding, and then we'd commercialize them together. But these bigger companies would have the sales and distribution and marketing channels to move forward. Well, long story short, it sounded like a great idea. We had you know, our Harvard, MIT, PhD, PhDs, Yale, Princeton, a bunch of smart people who all believed that was going to be a very successful model. We failed. I mean, when you get right down to it, we failed. It was, we were turning into a design engineering firm that I couldn't raise capital against. I couldn't grow to the point where I could, I could um, have a really great exit. So three years in and five or six million dollars in, I had to look at the investors and the board and say, this, this, is, a, this is not working. Uh, we need to shift. We need to close it or we need to shift and go back, back to a traditional model that we have all had success with before. And that's basically to, to build our own brand, build our own product, and sell it. It's old fashioned, simple, um, but in our industry, it works over and over and over again. So we took some of the best ideas that we had generated at that time. Uh, we worked with a wonderful engineering company called Fixed Engineering, and Doug and Paul are here. We've been working with them for six years now. They've stuck by us through thick and thin. And, um, and we, we developed what we thought was the best of the ideas that we had, a product called the Pick and Prep. And a few years ago, we got that product onto the market. Uh, a couple of years ago, we got onto the market. And since then, we've launched a second generation of that product. And we're about to launch third and fourth um, generations of the product. So, um, so anyway, the board, when we failed, took leadership in investing in the company again. And that gave some of the other outside investors confidence that, okay, we'll, we'll stick in, we'll, we'll do this, right? So we raised many more millions of dollars and, and were able to successfully um, charge forward. So, and it looks today like, like our company will be very successful. Excuse me, Gary. <clears throat> yeah. Was there one defining event when you, when you decided you got to stop this and move on? Was there one thing that just sort of crystallized it all in your head, we got we to yes, change gears here. Yeah. it's a great question, Greg. Greg asked if there was one defining event that sort of crystallized it all and suggested that we need to change and move on and have that tough, tough conversation. Um, yes, it was, we had, we, you know, unfortunately for me, because I could tell a good story, right, I was able to land two contracts with large companies pretty quickly, right? And I thought, ah, oh, this model is working, we're gonna take off, we'll develop these you know, concepts into products, and away we go. The closer we got to the market, 
it, first of all, it was hard to work with these large companies. Wonderful people, wonderful <coughs> people on the inside. But big companies take a long time to do anything, to pay, uh, to just to get a meeting and whatnot. It could take weeks. Uh, one of my great friends from, from those times is here, Elena, Elena Chernokowski. Um, so we built great, we forged great relationships, and we did the best that we could on all sides. But inevitably, it's just the way it was. And the, you know, things took time, a lot more time than we thought. As products started to march towards commercialization, it became clear that as a small company, we were not going to be manufacturing for Millipore. We had eight people, and just the burden of their process, you know, the, the uh, layers of bureaucracy that have to be in there just to make stuff fit into their, their quality and, you know, and product systems, it just wasn't going to happen. So it became clear that what Millipore really needed us to do was to transfer the technology into their, into their, uh, their hands. And, and we realized that that's not a model that ultimately could work. So that was that was sort of, when that happened, when they basically really put the screws to try to move the product in, I realized it's not going to work. We're going to fail. And I also failed at generating more of those those deals. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> I was lucky on two quick shots and then that was it. It was it was tough. And plus we were very busy with just the two deals that we had. So um, so we've anyway, we fell back to this business model that's sort of tried and true. Make what you sell, sell what you make. Kind of an approach. All right, we're going to get to Shirley's question here. <laughs> there, there it is. Defense with it a little bit. All right. Nope. You're back with that. The wrong way. That's a nice slide. Thanks, guys. All right. We are now moving in the right direction. Okay. So on building and keeping really great teams, uh, this is the most fun part of the company. It's all about the people that you work with, right? Um, and I screwed up a lot. I mean, I made all kinds of mistakes. We, we can talk about some of them, you know, but uh, I prefer to talk about the things that we kind of got going right. Um, it is most important when you start a company to have A plus people. Not A people, not A minus, not B plus, A plus. Get the best, smartest, most experienced, capable minds that, that you can work with in the senior management team of that company and never fail on that. I've heard venture capitalists say the first five hires in the company have to be absolutely top quality or the company won't be successful. I think that's true. I would add that as you that across the board in the company, you want to always try to hire the highest quality person for the jobs that need to be done. It's especially important, probably most important, in mid-management. That's where mediocrity will penetrate a company, right? It's in the middle management, when the when the process becomes the product, when people are covering their butts, when they hire lesser uh, spirited people or what have you. That I, I lived that. I lived that at Owl Scientific. I was too nice to let good people go who weren't a great fit for the company. They can be very nice, right? Most people are nice, but they may not be a great fit for the company. They may not, you know, help to lift the bar in the company. And I found to have the most success, to have the kind of most vibrant, exciting, happy environment, you really want to hire, uh, right across the board, engaged people. So, uh, and I get to know everybody. I know all of my employees, right? I, I like the interns, right? And so I, I like to know uh, a little bit about just about everybody, and I, I want to, you know, be there and kind of uh, accessible um, to those employees. I don't manage uh, anyone other than my direct reports. Um, and I do that badly, but, uh, uh, but anyway, so uh, anyway, that. That first point is really critical. When you hire A plus people, you're really a fool if you don't empower them, right? You you've hired them for a reason. They have a skill set that's just phenomenal. So one of my um, co-founders, uh, Todd Barbera, fantastic engineer, operational strength. He had these penetrative networks of other engineers who could help us to get our products done. Um, 
it would be pretty silly for me to tell him how to do his job. <laughs> you know, he's fantastic. And then we've got some other great people uh, that we brought on board as well. Our CSO, Chris Bowles, and, um, Director of Marketing, Alex Vera, and uh, VP of Operations, Heather Ketchum. That team has sort of gelled to the point now where uh, we're, we're about to go for uh, to raise some more capital. And historically, I always wrote the business plans. I'd ask them to give pieces of the plan to me, and I'd do the assembly and whatnot. So this time, they recognize this is, you know, Gary's pretty good at it, but he's not great at it. So they just did it. And sitting there on my desk yesterday was the best business plan this company has ever generated. And I realized, oh my God, I'm never going to have to write a business plan again in this, in this company. <laughs> they were so, it was, I almost cried. I ran out and hugged the CSO, you know, Chris. It was just fantastic. So I thought, I can raise money on this. I can tell this story, right? This is fantastic. Um, so in, in, in all cases, those people are empowered to do their jobs. I positively nudge them. Tony. Gary, everybody, I think everybody wants to hire people, those people, but how do you find people? Yeah, that's the we'll talk a little bit about that, I think, in the next slide. It's, it has more to do with uh, your networks and, more, and most to do with the interview process. Um, it, but, it, I, it, you know, it is easy. It's hard, but it's easy. You know, the, you're, you're looking for a certain type of people. You're networking in, uh, with top quality people themselves. You explain to someone, I need somebody who gets it, that can do these, <laughs> you know, they can step into this role and grow within that role and whatnot. And if you're if you you yourself are interacting with top top guns, then they're going to try to find top guns for you. So, and then it's the the filtration process, that filter of making the first hire, or, or making the right hire, so that you don't have to fire them later or make them you made a mistake. Usually, when when somebody comes on board um, and they're not right for the job, it's not their fault. It's your fault. Or it's the you know somebody it's the, it's the team's fault who didn't get the interview process done right who didn't really come to know that person or to really do the homework of uh, with the with the references and get to be penetrative about that. Okay, uh, so founding CEO founder you know my biggest job probably is to kind of nudge everybody in a positive direction and inspire them as best I can. Right, they tend to inspire themselves these days, which is kind of exciting. Um, in starting a company, mistakes are a good thing. Huge, catastrophic mistakes are a bad thing. <laughs> but, but empowering people enough so that they can make decisions and they can screw up and they can come back and say, oh, God, I screwed up. I, you know, uh, this is the, it's fine. Then the team wraps themselves around that mistake and we figure out what the right solution is, the best solution that we can, and off we go together. Right? But you want your people to be able to say, I screwed up. And you as a CEO have to be able to say that as well. Right? It's, a, it's a trust issue. Right? Um, okay. In, in terms of the, I'm going to step back a little bit, the positive nudging and inspiration. I'm not so sure I understand the power of positive thinking. I mean, I know it's a good thing, but I do know the power of negative. It's a bad thing, you know. Uh, you can you can bring a lot of fear into a company and darkness, and uh, whereas if you took the more positive path, things tend to be better. They tend to be much easier. Um, okay, let's let's go to the next one. technologically incompetent. I know I run, I run a biotech instrumentation company, right? But I mean, I can't program the TV things and stuff like that. Um, so every job in the company can be filled with somebody who loves it. It's just the truth. There's a lot of diversity in the human population, a lot of experiences and whatnot. So if somebody's not truly happy in that job and they can't be lifted up to become happy in that job, they're the wrong person for that job. It just isn't right for them. There's some there's some karmic mismatch that um, uh, that is there. That's not to say 
people can't start off sort of mismatched and then grow, if they have the potential to grow into a position. I, mean, I have one guy on staff who uh, he struggled in this sort of senior uh, position in the company, and I was wondering, mm, you know, is he going to work? But the whole team worked together, right? And then he just started to own it, and he's now in that particular field. He's one of the best that I've, I've ever met. Alex Beer, our marketing guy. So he sort of went through the struggling period and then just, just locked in and took off. That doesn't happen all the time, right? That takes, um, that takes commitment to each other and he had to want to do it. He was certainly smart enough to do it. Um, but if you start off with that premise and you look at your company and say, okay, uh, you know, are, do I have all the right uh, people for the right positions in the company? You know. You know in your heart where there's a mismatch, and then you can kind of work on that. Um, I think there's basically two types of C CEOs. I tried to reduce this down to, um, you know, how different companies work, and I call them the me CEO versus the team CEO. The me CEO, uh, they make all the crucial decisions in the company. It's a little bit dictatorial in terms of um, how things get done. They tend not to empowered very much, they, uh, people, have, people are constantly coming to them to solve the problem. They have to make the decision to solve the problem, right, whatever the, whatever the problem is. Mm -hmm. Those environments, uh, they, you know, sometimes the CEO, most of the time the CEO can get it right. You can get it right 99 out of 100 times. Um, you can be that sort of controlling uh, person, um, but inevitably you're going to make a mistake. You make mistakes with a team approach, as you know, that's also going to happen. But um, if you've empowered those employees, if they feel comfortable, you know, talking about whatever the problem is and the reality is and whatnot, and you, you're more likely to have a, a better turnaround um, if you if you take that kind of team effort. Um, so to 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 elaborate on that. Um, a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about human nature. So in the, in the me CEO type of an environment, they're not always bullies, but they can be bullies, right? And um, in a bullying environment where fear of losing your job ultimately um, causes you to not say things that you should say or to bite your lip about some some process or, or thing that could be improved or should be improved, but you just don't want to raise your head above the cubicle because it could get shot off or, um, <laughs> you know, the, those types of, uh, those work environments, they're just not happy places to be, right? Nobody really wants to work in an environment like that. Um, but, but many, many, many people do. Um, so conversely, a team-centric CEO will provide guiding strategy, um, the essential creative spirit and the positive interaction that, um, you know, where the team can work together. Even in good working groups, even in good working teams, you'll fall off of that, right? It's, it's sort of things will happen and there'll be, there'll be problems. So there's, there's signs for a CEO to look out when your company's starting to head down a negative path. The first sign is that you'll see people in the company starting to pair. <laughs> when we're running into trouble, it's a natural instinct to form allies, allegiances with other, other, other people in the company, right? So, uh, you know, you may have, uh, bless you. you, you may have the, you know, the engineers and going at it with the marketing people or whatever the, you know, but there's some, there's, uh, there's some problem there. It's usually the CEO's fault. It's always been my fault. At some level, I was too weak, or I didn't, uh, I didn't anticipate it, or I was too confused about understanding what the hell was going on with these interactions. But now, uh, now I've come to understand this sort of little bit of human nature. What you really want in your company is to have people of disparate backgrounds, you know, right-wing Republicans and uh, left-wing hippie Democrats, and uh, all races and creeds and colors working together. They don't have to agree on politics, but they need to respect each other within the company so that they can stand up and uh, kind of vehemently disagree about the direction that you know, the product development is taking or 
the features that a product needs to have or whatever, whatever the, the thing is in the company, um, but still have mutual respect on both sides. That's a fantastic thing. You actually want to encourage a respectful disagreement within a company. If you don't, you're not building the, the best product that you can. If everybody's just going along in an agreement and whatnot, you'll launch a product that'll miss some critical uh, feature set that somebody in the group knew needed to be there, right? So, Ed? Do you care to have a, do you have a particular anecdote that you think is practical to share as to what you went through to pull a team back on track? Yes, but they're personal. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I don't think I should share them because they involve people who are in the company close to me. But uh, yeah, I think I'd be happy to talk privately about some of these things. But uh, but thank you for asking the question. So um, uh, and, and truthfully, I I didn't get this most of my entrepreneurial career. Right? I was a bully sometimes. I made those mistakes. I. You know, fired people who didn't deserve to be fired. I hired people who didn't deserve to be hired. I mean, it's just, it's, there's this growing um, thing about being an entrepreneur and a CEO. By the time you get bald and gray hair and whatnot, you've earned it. You, you, you know a lot. You've got wonderful networks, and this, you just don't make the same mistakes that you would make as a younger person. Sometimes. Right. Sometimes. Sometimes. Oh, yeah. I'm so <laughs> pretty good at making mistakes. They tend to be newer ones, not, yeah. not repeat ones. Yes? I want to ask you, what was it that made you change? And you, um, you know, I see this an awful lot in the workforce right now, certainly with economic uncertainty. There's an awful lot of uh, companies that are just getting worse and worse and worse and functionality and things like that. And, and um, you know, for me as a So, so the question was, what uh, what turned the light on for me in terms of uh, you know trying not to be a bully and kind of realizing some of these uh, these things? I think ultimately, you know, in your heart, it, you know, that you can be confused about uh, what's going on. Why are these people fighting? What's you know? I've certainly not understood you know types of things like that. But when I stepped back and just looked at what was happening. Why, you know, what's the faction and what's the true root of, uh, of what's going on here? That really helped a lot. Um, I also joined a CEO group. Um, I'm a member of uh, uh, Vistage 140. It's a, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Is that Lauren Carlson's group? Uh, no, that's a biotech group that Lauren oh. runs. Uh, this is Guy Fink's group, Guy's in Gloucester. And uh, it's one of the most illuminating experiences of my life. You're in with a group of non-competing CEOs. This is a quick side thing. Um, you build bridges and bonds and connections with them. It's just amazing to be in a room with 18, you know, really smart people who have been around and, and done it before. And then and also find that you can make contributions to them as well. You can, you can help them with their businesses. So, um, so part of it also came just from this sort of growth growth process in, in my life uh, as a CEO. Uh, but if you look for the signs of trouble, then you can look for solutions to these, um, these types of problems. Do you, do you like your job better? I love my job better. Yeah. It's, it ultimately comes down to the truth, right? It's all about the truth and trust. Your employees need to trust you. You need to trust them. If you want to build great things, there has to be that mutual trust. They can't have one foot out the door, right? And uh, you know, looking for other jobs and things like that. You want them to be passionate about the business and about their jobs and the company and each other, right? You want them to to um, love their jobs and, and want to make them, you know, not lose them, make make the company more successful. Um. Okay, so so when there's if you've got kind of a bully CEO. Often there'll be this kind of pairing stuff that goes on. 
Um, the typical life cycle of this, and, and it's not to say that there aren't bully CEOs who are financially very successful. It, it happens all the time, GE and big companies and stuff like that. But when you're building a startup, when you're building uh, an early stage company, you can build it based on fear, um, but you'll be bringing in lots of angst and lots of trouble and lots of uh, worries and whatnot. If you build it based on truth and love and light and all the good, the good, you know, the, not the dark side. Um, I'll get it again. Um, then you're, you're, you'll be happier. Your, your people will be happier, and you're more likely to be more successful. I didn't start Sage off this way. These are just evolutions over the course of time, and I, I feel personally as though I finally come, I finally get it what a CEO really needs to do, and, and I'm finally kind of getting uh, worthy of the of the job. Thank you. Um, Yeah. They're the rock stars in our worldview. And if you look at the companies that have actually succeeded, like Kimberly Clark succeeded four or five times better than GE in the same period, but who do we hear about? Right. You know, so thank yeah. you. I, I so I to me it's more people need to hear that. Well, thank you for pointing it out. It it may also be our age, it may be our time. There was a time when a lot of CEOs came out of the military, right? They were, uh, there was a strict, rigid hierarchy, the boss was the boss, and this is the way things kind of needed to be done. I'm not so sure that fits with, with, with where we are now as, as a people, as a community and whatnot. I think we're all starting to understand the power that we can bring to the table if we're allowed um, to do that. So to finish the thought of the bully kind of thing, uh, so what will happen is first you'll start to see this pairing got to really watch out for that. And then, you know, and they'll be fighting back and forth. Um, these little cliques and groups will kind of form. This, I think this happens in monkeys, too, right, when they have problems <laughs> with the group. We're primates. We really are. These are instinctual things. When you're in trouble, you look for an ally, right? You look for somebody to be on your side. So then uh, the more senior <coughs> monkeys in the clan, if you will, um, they start to hatch plans. <laughs> And it's usually against the CEO. Um, so one of those folks is going to eventually take a shot at the board level, right? And, and you know, get some of the, the directors going and inflamed and whatnot. Sooner or later, the CEO gets shot in the head. And then the board, in its infinite wisdom, brings in another better bully, right? They think that that's sort of like the solution to the problem. Um, this is the typical cycle. 80, 90% of companies are going through these types of um, hierarchical, hierarchical, hierarchical pain, if you will. But um, it doesn't have to be that way. So, uh, so when you start to notice those signs, if you see the pairing starting to happen, that's your opportunity to bring everybody together and do your level best to get things back to it. Take ownership of the problem and then um, you know, try to get everybody back to a respectful working relationship. You can you want them to disagree about all kinds of things, so you get to the best place, the most you know, uh, best product, or what have you. But you want them to do so where they really respect each other. You have to be able to say, um, I think this is actually on the next slide, but you have to be honest enough with yourself and with them to admit when you're wrong, to say you're sorry. That's the slide before. No kidding. I missed all that. All right, sorry. Um, let me just back up for a second because there was some good stuff there. But, oh, we need to wrap it up. All right. Um, so anyway, uh, so I guess we're, we're pretty much at the end. We have one more slide. This took longer than I thought. I'm sorry, guys. Um, in terms of exits, must you? <laughs> one of the loves of building a business is growing it. If you take investors in, then you have to exit that company. If you have to exit that company, then from the moment you start it, you should be thinking about the exit itself and positioning it so that it will have great value to a group of inquirers. You want acquirers. You want to be able to sell it to, uh, or, or whatever the exit is, IPO or what have you. Most of the time, there'll be trade sales. You want to make sure that there's a horse race for that company and that you've positioned your 
little gem of a company um, so that a lot of companies are going to want it and it'll have high value. So that's it. Thank you. That was wonderful. So now I know you guys didn't come to see me. Uh, Gary, thank you so much. for That was great. And uh, as I said, Gary is our resident mentor here. And uh, I can tell you what a great presentation it was. And we're videotaping this. We're hoping uh, to make it available on the uh, web. It'll be there. And we'll let you know what it is if you want to show it to anybody else. Thank you very much for coming. Um, we don't lock the door right away. Uh, so feel free to uh, network a little bit, talk to Gary, and be sure you see the guys from uh, FedEx in the background. Jack, you have a... Jack's making a question. There was a little discussion about uh, crowdfunding earlier, and I found a... Uh, most of these crowdfunding sites are uh, established by people who don't have any experience in investment banking or in funding. Uh, but I did find one uh, out in Arizona, Confident Crowd. It's run by an investment bank that's been around since 1988. It's done about $20 billion in deals, average deal size of about $50 million. And they're getting a jump start on waiting for the SEC to come out with the rules for the uh, crowdfunding. And they're actually using accredited investors on, on their site right now for deals. Anybody is looking funds. It's confident crowd. You might look at the company. I'm not endorsing them, but they look like the most prepared and experienced guys that I've seen. And uh, you can actually raise money now. Could you announce the attentive seminar? Which is when? January 4th. January 4th. Attentive. Um, the Rocket. Uh, <laughs> Eric Gordon's company. Yes. Attentive uh, will be our, our next program. Uh, that will be in Woburn at the 128 uh, Trade Center. Uh, Eric's company just received their A round, uh, and it is a uh, non-pharmaceutical uh, uh, way of uh, therapy for ADD, at least in its initial uh, application, and it uses a, uh, a brain-computer interface, and it uh, benchmarks your, your uh, attention span, uh, and build your attention span by playing a game, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's a, a really innovative way of looking at this. Eric uh, previously had been at Biobehavioral Diagnostics, where he was CEO, and has been the CEO at Arcule, uh, and really found that medicine and Ritalin and other things were not prescribed well. If you stop taking it, you still had the problem. And was really looking for a way to therapeutically address something without using drugs. And he seems to have found that. And he's got an engagement from uh, education. Shelley? Yeah, I just have one thing regarding that crowdfunding. Actually, Richard Gill successfully raised his next round at True Touch using it. I don't know it's, if you go to the True Touch website, I think it lists the... Um, yeah, that was, that was an angel list. Angel soft, there's a bunch of those out there. I mean, we will see something the SEC is they're scheduled to release the uh, regulations by January 1st. But uh, who knows if they'll make it? Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Okay. You're welcome. Good luck to you. Thank you. Good to see you, Molly. I'm going to pop in Monday. And hopefully, I'll see you soon too. We're doing our all our questions going on today. Pepper. So, what I'm going to do is I'll pass along. Just in case. Sure. Okay. Sorry. You should talk to the company that we just found the one that. Peter, excuse me, did you know I did you ever I wanted to introduce you to Alison. Hi, nice to meet you. She's a recent
recent biotechnology graduate from UNH. Okay. Which yeah. is looking for opportunities, and I thought maybe if she came to one of your events, you might yeah. do something. Yeah. No. Um, he's not going to be uh, So we are uh, part of our. Uh, we are a very active community. Uh, 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 big to small. So he's with the biosciences. I'm getting north today. I'm going to have to do my I graduated with um, a master's in biochemistry and biochemistry.